I guess we're not going to do that anymore. First Kings, let's stand together, shall we, for the reading of God's word? Amen. Amen. First Kings uh, chapter 21 and verses 1 through 3. Last uh, week I preached uh, about Jacob, uh, a life that God blesses. Um, Today I'm going to preach about Naboth, the man who said no. And uh, (laughs) we're going to preach from 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 1 through 3. Amen. You all happy to be here? Everybody awake? Good. Amen. Amen. Somebody said they woke up just as their parents were about to drive away and about to leave and just barely barely got awake in time to get here. Uh, Somebody got stuck in a drive-thru at uh, at Starbucks. I almost did. I drove in there and looked at the lineup and thought, oh, no, I can't do this. So if I'm a little off this morning, it's because I'm missing my Starbucks this morning, okay? You all with me? You all give me some mercy and forgiveness for this, right? (laughs) Amen. (laughs) It's an advertisement for Starbucks, I guess. Yeah. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 1 through 3. And uh, if you are there, it'll also be up behind me if you're not there. Now Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard in Jezreel uh, beside the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And after this, Ahab... Uh, said to Naboth, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden. And because it is near my house, and I will give you a better vineyard for it, or if it seems good to you, I will give you its value in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my father. Read that again. But Naboth said to uh, Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, I I just love you so very much. Thank you, Jesus, for your word today. Thank you, Lord, that we were just, God, you just blessed us so richly. And I thank you that we were able to work out some details of some things this past week. I thank you, Lord, that uh, we are able to gather together and worship together. What a great thing that is. There is strength in worship when we come together. There is strength in our praise and the fellowship that we have. And, and Lord, I just thank you for the strength that uh, not only from you, but from your people. And, and Lord, I just appreciate so very much those that you have placed in my life because, God, they are such a blessing to me and they strengthen my heart, my mind, and, and God, my will as far as uh, uh, living for you and serving you. I just thank you for, you, for each one of them. Lord, as I uh, preach today, I pray that your anointing will be in this place. Father, that uh, you will not an only anoint your word as it, it is preached, but Father, that you will also anoint those that are, are here in this building to be able to hear the message, but also those that are, will be joining us online and those that uh, may watch later on and be able to download it and watch it. Father, I just uh, pray that those that may have been discouraged by our feed over the last probably month or so, Father, that they will, you'll just draw them back, that they will, uh, they'll come back and be able to uh, participate in our services online. And, and Father, I pray that you will just move in every household and every heart and every mind to draw each one closer to you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let's take a few moments, shall we? Let's just, uh, we're not in a hurry today to get through this service. Let's take some time and just worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, when I think of all that you have done, where you brought me out of, Father, what you have brought me into, Jesus, Father, the things that you have given me in your kingdom, the things that you have blessed my life with, Father, I just want to worship you, Jesus, worship you with all of my heart, my soul, my strength, with everything that is in me, Lord, I desire more of you today. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. You may be 
seated in Jesus' name. I don't know if any of you have ever received an inheritance. Uh, I think some of you have maybe recently, and, uh, and myself, I would be included in that, uh, in that group that have received an inheritance from my parents. Um, they leave us a lot of things sometimes. Sometimes they don't. And I've told my children that I'm probably going to try and spend it all and leave them with all my bills. And so they will be left with something. Uh, <laughs> but uh, joking, everybody smile. Amen. Um, but we oftentimes are left uh, some sort of possession. Sometimes they're, they're keepsakes. Sometimes there are special things that uh, maybe mean something to us that our parents owned or had or or, uh, and they left it to us so that we would have this remembrance of them. Uh, for myself, I know that my wife, oftentimes, she will, uh, she'll just out of the blue say, boy, I miss my parents. And so just, just having that is not necessarily everything that, is, that you want. There is still something missing in your life. And then when I was writing this down, I was thinking about my own parents. And, um, of course, my mom just passed away just about a year ago now, and my dad uh, it'll be five years ago uh, coming up this July, and uh, it's an odd thing. My mom passed away exactly four years to the day after my dad had, and they were four years difference in age, and, and, uh, and so, uh, but it was just watching my mom during the latter days of her life and, and just seeing, going in there and visiting with her, the whole time, she, it was like she, she had one hand raised, and, and I don't know about all of you, but I've, I've watched, and I know that if I keep my hand ra- raised long enough that my arms get tired, right? My mom was pretty weak at the very end, and yet, yet you couldn't hardly get her to lower her hand. She had her hand raised just about all the time. Her pastor, Brother Rideout, came and, and was trying to talk to her and say, uh, do you want something, thinking that she was asking. Sister Rideout, by inspiration, I suppose, says, She's seeing a place that is beyond our comprehension right now. She's seeing things that we don't see. And it was like she was looking off into the distance and had her hand held out as if she was waiting for Jesus to grab a hold of her hand and take her home, which I believe that she was. But I miss them. I miss my dad's joking around. My dad was just always doing that. And uh, my mom, uh, I, I miss her love, empathy, and her caring attitude and spirit that she had. And I miss those things. But they passed some things on to me. They left some money for myself and uh, for some of my brothers. They, my dad left the business for them to be able to uh, continue with and as part of their inheritance. But they also gave us other things as part of our inheritance. They, um, some of these things we acquired as we were growing up. They, they tried to place their values, their work ethic, their morals, their, their way that they would live. And, and I remember my dad uh, working so hard on me because he, he thought I was a little lazy, which in all honesty, after looking back from all of these years, I was. Uh, and he, was, he tried really hard to get that out of me. And, uh, and so uh, <laughs> he made sure that I worked. And then he would double check and make sure I'd done it well. And if I didn't do it well enough, then I had to do it all over again. And... Uh, and so he made sure that, uh, that some things in me were built into me. That's part of my inheritance, part of my heritage from my parents. And uh, so I miss those things. But we also have a spiritual inheritance that we have and uh, that, are, that is passed down to us as well. We have a spiritual heritage that comes uh, beginning with, of course, in the Old Testament, those men of faith that, that began in their service to God without the Holy Ghost, I might add, in their lives, the Holy Ghost moved on them, but did not fill them as it has in the New Testament. The Bible says that could not happen until Jesus had died, and until he was glorified, that the Holy Ghost could actually infill those of us that are in the church today. But we received a spiritual inher- inheritance or heritage from our spiritual fathers. Hopefully from Abraham we got faithfulness. Hopefully from uh, Enoch we got the fact that we would walk with God and that God would take us out of this place one day. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Uh, Hopefully we got some things from those Old Testament uh, saints and and those Old Testament men and women that lived for God, served God in the midst of a very difficult time. There was warfares, and it it was a brutal time, and yet they still managed. I look at Noah and think that 
for a hundred years he worked on that ark to build an ark and all the time he preached to others about God and that God was coming and that judgment was coming and yet in all of his preaching for a hundred years he still only left with himself his three sons and their wives on the ark well along with all the animals that he placed there uh, so but hopefully we received some things from them but we also received a spiritual heritage from the beginning of those apostles that walked with Jesus for the three and a half years that Jesus' ministry was in this world. And uh, he taught them things. And not only by things that we can read about in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John and in the life of Jesus, but also they learned some things from watching him and being around him. You, you get things from people you hang out with. And, uh, and hopefully your parents... Uh, will pass on to you and have passed on to you some good things into your life, some heritage and, and some spiritual heritage. With them, we learned about, uh, uh, well, we learned about success. We learned about inspiration. We learned about revelation as we learned from Peter when Jesus asked, who knew, who knew Ben say that I am? And then asked, whom do you say that I am? Hopefully we learn, learn some things from them in their relationship with Jesus while he walked in this world. Hopefully we, hopefully we learned about faith, that we learned about miracles, signs and wonders and things that are possible in this kingdom, things that are possible not only for them back then, but are possible for you and I today. We need to keep ourselves in an atmosphere, in a place where, where a church still believes in signs, wonders, miracles, and all of those things that Jesus promised that greater than these will you do because I have to go to my Father. And uh, so there's a, there's a heritage and, and a spiritual heritage that included not only the things that they did, also the way that they preached, also their values, their morals, their ethics. Those things have been passed on to us, not only by their lives and by reading about their lives through the book of Acts and, and by, um, by the things that they've written in here, but also in the way that they were inspired by the Holy Ghost to write about how this kingdom works in our lives. That comes from this book. It doesn't come from modern day prophets or people who want to change it or rewrite it or write their own additions or subtractions from this book. That comes from this book alone. Amen. And, uh, and so we've received this, and, and this should be our, our, our guideline. This should be what we live by. This should be what inspires our life. This should be what we look at and what we design the things that we do and how we live our lives, whether it's in a marriage relationship with our children, with people in the church, with those that are lost in this world. How we live our lives when nobody is watching should be... Uh, designated to us from this word and no other way. Amen. Sometimes this word needs interpretation. God has given the ministry uh, in this day and age to be able to, uh, and has anointed and called his ministry to be able to preach. And so the Bible says that, that men are saved by the foolishness of preaching. Seems weird to us that, that we would need a pastor in this day and age especially given the arrogance that we sometimes have and believe our own intellect and will can cause us to be able to figure it out all on our own without somebody to explain what is written. I look back on the New Testament and, uh, and how Philip was translated and found himself in a desert and this man is going by on his chariot and he's reading from Isaiah and uh, did not understand, couldn't figure out what was going on or what Isaiah was writing about and God told, uh, told Philip, attach yourself uh, to this chariot. And so here's Philip running alongside, asking if he can get permission to get on the chariot. Hops on and begins from, uh, from the very beginning to show this man uh, what the word was indicating to him. And they stopped, of course, by water. And he baptized that Ethiopian. And he went on his way. And Philip was translated again to another place. And uh, what a great thing it is. We've received a lot of inheritance. We've received a lot of things from those that have gone on before us. Uh, we talked about in the previous message that, uh, uh, that we are to be Jesus in this world. And uh, Galatians 3 and 27, it says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We have received not only 
directions, but we have received the very character, personality of Jesus Christ that is resident in us by our baptism in water, by our baptism in the Holy Ghost. There is something inside of us that changes so that it should be said of us, as it was of Peter and John, they took note of these men that they were ignorant and unlearned, but they also took note that they had been with Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so we've received not only these directions by the Word of God, but also the character and the personality of Jesus Christ needs to reside in you and me. Amen. Are you all with me? Amen. And so our inheritance, uh, we received an inheritance. What we received, first of all, through this new birth is, is something so precious and so wonderful uh, that, uh, that we cannot think of it as just being casual or something that can be compromised at the, at the soonest uh, time that we can figure it out or that something tempts us to go in a different direction. Naboth received his vineyard, this man who said no to a king. He received his, this vineyard as his portion of the promised land. Uh, just informational-wise, uh, when they came to the promised land, each tribe was given a certain area of the land of Israel. Now, a couple of the tribes remained outside on the other side of the River Jordan, but they were required to cross over into the promised land and help those that... Uh, uh, that were still trying to uh, take over the land to help them conquer the land. Then they were given permission to go back to the land that they desired to have on the other side of Jordan. And, uh, but they were all required to enter into the promised land. But inside the promised land, it was all divided up. And if you go to your map at the back of the Bible, you'll see how it was divided up into the 12 tribes of Israel. And they all had a portion. But within those tribes also... Uh, you're going you're gonna to notice that, well, first of all, if you read your Bible and go back, it was, it was done by lots. So, so they would pick lots and say, okay, you get to choose this land. You know, I don't know if you remember Caleb. He said, give me that area. Ma oh, what was it? Mount Hebron. He says, give me that area there. He says, there's giants there. And, uh, and I'm, they're not defeated yet, but, uh, but I'm going to go there and I'm going to beat them and I'm going to conquer that land. And so by law, I mean, some people probably chose the easy stuff. Uh, he chose, Caleb chose the most difficult probably area of Israel to conquer for his own land. And, uh, and so they were all given portions. And, and Naboth's portion was in Jezreel. But not only was it in Jezreel, his portion, his inheritance, what he received when he entered in the promised land... All of you know that the promised land is a type of entering into the kingdom of God or God's church, God's people. You're born again into this kingdom of water and, by water and spirit. And, and so when you're born again into this kingdom, uh, all the things that God has promised us to be available to us in the kingdom are also part of this inheritance that we've received. Amen. You've got it. You don't need to... Ask for it or worry about it. You just need to claim that inheritance. You need to claim it and say, this is mine. You say, well, is it going to be without opposition? We're going to talk about that in a little bit. There may be a little opposition. Yeah, there may be a lot of opposition to you having the things that God wants you to have and God's promised that you will have and that you do have as part of this inheritance. Naboth, Naboth received this vineyard as his portion of the promised land. But it was right up against Ahab's palace in Jezreel. Now, Ahab had a wife named Jezebel. And Jezebel, the Bible says uh, in the passage that I was reading this morning, incited him to do evil in the sight of God. And so he went after idols. He Honestly, this guy was just bad. He was just weak and he was bad and he was a baby and, and all the rest of it. And his wife basically uh, ruled him and helped him to, uh, to go in the direction that he went in and as far as idols go. But there was one thing that happened in his life. Listen, he was bad from the very beginning. But this one thing that he did caused God to come and judge his whole family. What we're going to read about, what we're going to talk about today. This one thing that, uh, that he did. So I'm going to use Ahab and Jezebel as a type of the enemies that we have uh, in, this, in our 
existence in the church today and in our walk with God. Because there is opposition. In uh, this last week, I was discussing that with an individual that I was with, and we started talking about it, and talking about uh, the fact that Satan is real. Have you noticed in this day and age that, that the world has kind of made Satan a cartoon figure? Do you know why that is? Because they don't want you to take seriously what he's really like. He's roaring, walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now let me, let me clarify this for you. He's not after those that are already a part of his kingdom, that are under his domain. He is walking about seeking to devour those that are living for God and those that have decided that they're not going to abide by this world's systems, values, morals, or ethics. That you're going to live by God's morals, God's ethics, God's principles. And so he's after you because you're an affront to him. You stand in opposition to everything that he's tempting the world with right now. And you tell him that, that I'm not going to live that way anymore. I'm not going to participate in that anymore. I'm going to be godly. I'm going to be righteous. I'm going to reflect Jesus Christ to those that are around me. And he says, oh no, I'm coming after you. And so it is that, uh, I re how many of you remember uh, from church camp, uh, Brother Dylan's message that uh, he said, the church at the gates of hell. Anybody remember that message? I, it just occurred to me as I was writing down this message here. And so Jezreel's inheritance and our inheritance is right up against our enemy's territory. We are in the world, but we are not we are right up against everything that he is trying to do of all the perversion, of all the wickedness. I want you to know that through our social media, through our, our television, through everything that is out there right now, there is stuff out there that is perverse. There's stuff out there that is wrong. And the whole attention of this world is on the idea that we need to accept it as being okay. When God said it wasn't. Our lives should stand in opposition to everything that our world would say that is right, uh, that is not right. And, and so we stand in opposition. So just as uh, Naboth's vineyard was right up against this evil king's palace, so it is that the church is also built and your life is being built right in the midst of and up against the evil that is around us and in this world. Well, we receive some things from God that are a part of this righteousness or a part of this kingdom that we have through the new birth. Let me just go back and say, we need to remember Jesus' message to Nicodemus. You need to go back and read John chapter 3 in its entirety again. John chapter 4 and, and, and look at those and... And when Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, wondering how he could be saved, and Jesus says, you must be born again. You cannot see nor enter into the kingdom of God unless you're born again of water and of spirit. And uh, I know the enemy would ha want to take that away from us and have us compromise that, have us change the message in order to maybe fit in with all those that are around us. But I want you to know today that the message is precious. It is a part of our inheritance that we have this message and we hold fast to this message. It's a funny thing, but, uh, well, maybe it's not so funny, but in the, in the book of Acts, we can look at the history of it all and we see up until 20 to 30 years after Pentecost, Paul's still preaching the same thing. Where he met some believers, he met some that those had faith, and, and I think it was about 12 in number, and he says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said they did not know that there be any such thing as the Holy Ghost. How then were you baptized? And they were baptized unto John's baptism. Paul rebaptized them in Jesus' name. They received the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And both went on their different ways after that. The new birth was still the same 30 years after the day of Pentecost. It didn't change. The fact is, can I tell you this? That message never changed until Constantine became emperor of Rome. And he began to change some of that message. I know that Paul talks about they were trying to change it. There were those that were trying to water it down, even in his day and age. But I want you to know the message remained the same. But the kingdom of God, first of all, is righteousness. Listen, Naboth went to his vineyard, and out of a vineyard he got grapes. He got to 
partake of the grapes of that vineyard. He got to have all of the grapes that he would want to. There are things in the kingdom of God that God wants us to have in our lives. They're just there. They're, they should grow in you as a child of God. They should be part of your life. And the first thing is righteousness. But the Bible tells us in Romans, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So the first one, now if you want to define righteousness, I know that we want to change the definition, but the definition of righteousness is a state of being right or right conduct. So I know that, look, I know that within me, I cannot be righteous without God. I know that for a fact. But there's got to be something in me that wants to seek after that righteousness. Amen. There's got to be something in me that, that says, hey, I've got to be more righteous than what I am. I've got to have more of God in my life. You say it, it discourages me that, that when I come to God that I can't be all of those things immediately. There's still faults in me. And I know that the disciples felt the same thing. But I want you to know that when you desire that righteousness... As soon as something like that happens, there is the desire in you to get back close to God again. God, I want this gone from my life. God, I don't need this in my life. God, you've got to help me with this. You've got to strengthen me. I've got to have your righteousness working within me. The quality of, uh, part of the definition, the quality of being right or just, uh, these are all definitions of the word righteousness. Whatever conforms to the revealed will of God. And then the last part of that definition is whatever, had been, whatever has been appointed by God to be acknowledged and obeyed by man. That's the definition of righteousness. So when God says it, the biggest thing that we can do is, the best thing we can do is what? Do it. Obey. Amen. Now how many of you like to uh, submit? I <laughs> like the results of submission. Submission goes against our nature. It goes against the, the human nature, the fallen nature. Submission does. But submission to God is the only way that God righteousness can be instilled into our lives and that it becomes a part of our lives. But it's not only righteousness, it's also peace that, that the Bible says are a part of this kingdom and, and uh, joy, that joy that, uh, that doesn't come from from what we're doing on the outside, but comes because of our relationship with God. Along with it in this kingdom, we also can partake of the fruit of love, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Along with this kingdom, Jesus promised miracles, signs, wonders, healing, deliverance from, from things that would try and tie us down. God promised us those things. Those are things that we can partake of as part of our inheritance within the kingdom of God. And everybody said, hey, ma'am, aren't you glad you're a part of the kingdom today? Amen. Amen. Well, the enemy desires to take those things away from you. The enemy wants you to release those things. He can't physically steal them from you, but he most certainly can tempt you to give them up. So hate, Satan hates this, that you have these qualities in you and that you are able to exhibit them to those that are around you. So he will try and convince you that what he has to offer is better than what you have in the Holy Ghost. Just as Ahab said, hey, give me your vineyard, Naboth. He says, and I will give you something better than what you have. And if you don't like what I'm giving you, then I'll give you money instead. And isn't it funny that money seems to be always included to some degree in Satan's temptations in our lives. But he said, I'm going to offer you something better. Don't you believe that there is anything better out there than living for God in God's kingdom? Amen. If you even give a cent to it, even a little bit, you will give him a foothold that he will not release until he gets just a little bit more and then just a little bit more and a little bit more until he is able to take all that you have and uh, take it away from you. So he hates it. So he will try and convince you uh, that uh, what he has is better uh, than what you have in the Holy Ghost. Um, 
He does this through a number of different ways by having you, but most of all, it's through your thoughts and the things that he tries to convince you of. How many of you know that the battlefield for, for all of these things happens within your mind? Happens between your ears. Happens in the things that you think about and the things that you dwell on. I will guarantee you in the Garden of Eden that Adam and Eve thought about eating of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil for a long time before they actually went over there and tried it. Just because that's the way he works. That is the way he works in, in our lives or tries to work in our lives. So he will try and convince you that righteousness is not necessary. He would rather have you say, hey, look at all this business of living for God is stopping you from being able to do what you want when you want to do it. And, uh, and after a while, you're going to begin to think, hey, you know what? If you let that thought live there for a little bit, you're going to think about it long enough. Eventually, you will say, well, I think I should do this. I will participate in this. He will try and take your peace away. Uh, he will have you think that it's in government stability, economic stability, relationship stability, the amount of money in your bank account, uh, all of those things, those things that you have coming in. He will try and convince you that, uh, that all of those things can bring about peace in your life and contentment and that you will not have, um, not have to have the peace of God in your life. He'll try and take your joy away. Uh, um, joy in what God has done in your life, joy in the things that God has also got prepared for you. And uh, so Abath and Ahab, pardon me, uh, when they, I kind of combined their names here, didn't I? Ahab, uh, when, uh, when Naboth said no to him, he says, how can I give you what God has given me for my inheritance? How could I possibly give that up? Because it's God's gift to me. And, uh, and so he said no. He said no to the king. Oops, my glasses just broke. Hmm. He said no to the king. You can't have it. Now, Ahab went back home to his palace. Get this. Have you read this? He lay on his bed and wouldn't eat. And he's pouting. And he's, have you got that up? He must have it there. Everybody's looking at the screen. I'm, what's going on here? <laughs> and he's pouting. He's laying on his bed and he won't eat. No, I don't want to eat. No, nope, not getting up off of my bed. And he's crying and he's whining and he's complaining. What a baby. And his wife comes to him and says, what's your problem? You're the king. I'll take care of this. I'll give you this vineyard. And of course, Jezebel has um, Naboth killed and, and gives the uh, gives the field to Ahab as a gift. God came down and judged Ahab and Jezebel for what they did. And even though Ahab repented afterwards and was allowed to die without seeing God's judgment immediately upon his death, everything that, that was prophesied by the prophet came to pass for Ahab's family and those that were a part of it. But there was a man that just said no. No, I'm not going to. Let's stand together, shall we? No, I'm not going to give up not one part of what God has given me within the kingdom. In this day and age, the enemy would have you to believe that miracles are not possible anymore. Well, let me tell you today that God's miracles are still happening in our world today. God's miracles are, can still happen within this church, within this city, within our lives today. God is still doing miracles. When we, hallelujah, when we pray, when we get up here and we have prayer at the beginning for God to do a healing, or we come on Monday nights and we have our list of those that we're going to pray for, I want you to know God works immediately upon us, raising those people's names before heaven. God is still doing miracles, not only in third world countries. God is still doing miracles within uh, countries like the U.S. and Canada and in Europe today, God is still doing miracles. The enemy would have you believe that you cannot be free of the, the things that have tied you down and caused you to be what you know that you should not be in the kingdom of God. That all of the things that God delivered you from, those things you are still delivered from. Because God is still our deliverer. He is still the one that takes those things away. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I go to Paul's writing to the book of Romans in chapter 12 where Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or only true form of worship that you need to have in your life. And I want you to know today that, that just say no. When you feel like there's, there's something that says you're not going to be healed, just say no. Yes, I am going to be healed. Enemy, you are not going to say this. I'm not going to believe you. I'm not going to take not one word that you say and apply it or, or let it exist in my mind from this point onward. But I'm going to believe in God's touch and God's healing and God's work in my life. Amen. 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 Now, I can't even read anymore because I can't put my glasses on because the arm is gone. Is that right? Do you have reading glasses? Oh, you know what? I can do this. I can do this. Amen. Where's my... Absolutely. Amen. Holy cow, that's difficult. We've got to hold on and say no when there would be... Uh, compromise on you must be born again. We've got to say no when he would come and, and reject and would offer the pleasures of sin. We've got to say no to those things and hold on to the righteousness that God would have us to have in our lives. We've got to say no when worry and anxiety and fear consume our lives to the place that, that God has become a second place to our depression or discouragement that also steals away the joy and a sense of hopelessness comes into our lives whenever this happens. And the joy of God is no longer our strength anymore. All of those things. We've got to say no to those things. Say, Satan, you're not going to cause those to remain in me. I'm going to hold on to the joy of the Lord. I'm going to hold on to God's peace in my life. I'm going to hold on to the righteousness of God. I'm not going to compromise on what the Word of God has to say to me. And God is going to be my all in all. First Peter, I used to have this on my phone, but I forgot to get my phone. First Peter chapter 1. Oh man, this is annoying. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me get there. First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. I'm going to finish up with this passage of Scripture. It said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead let me read that again blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ according to his great mercy he has caused us to be born again not to to go back again to the things that we were not to be tempted with those things but to believe in the promises of God to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 4. To an inheritance. Look at this. To an inheritance. God has given us a portion. Ephesians tells us. Listen. What you've got right now is just a down payment of all that God has for you. The righteousness, peace, and joy that are in our lives right now because of the Holy Ghost... That's just a portion of what God has got in store for us. The healing, the miracles, the signs, all of that. Whatever you've seen in your lifetime, that is just a minute portion of all that God wants to do and all that God is going to cause to happen and have to happen in your life. Verse 4. To an inheritance that is imperishable. Listen, this inheritance that God has placed in our lives cannot perish I don't care what the enemy says I don't care if he tells you these things aren't here for us today in this day and age I want you to know every portion of that inheritance cannot die healing cannot pass away miracles cannot pass away revelation and prophecy are going to happen in accordance with God's word all the things the peace and the joy and the righteousness I want you to know they're still a part of our lives this cannot die in you you can give it up but it cannot die in you amen amen to an inheritance that is imperishable that is undefiled undefiled means it's not tainted 
that sin ha- can't touch these things, that the things in your life, I want you to know the things of this world, they cannot change the promises of God that God has got, given you in your life. They are still there and they're undefiled and, they're, and it is not fading. I don't care what he says, these things are not going away. They're not getting worse with the, the further we get and the closer we get to the coming of the Lord. But these things are growing and they are going to be even more prevalent in the darkness that is coming to our world in the end times. Amen. To an inheritance, uh, imperishable, undefiled, unfading, that is restored and kept in heaven for you. These things are there. Verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed. In when? How many believe that we are in the last times? God has got all these promises ready to be revealed. I want you to know that through 2,000 years since since the day of Pentecost, those 2,000 years that God has been guarding all of these things, that they're still there, but they're going to be revealed in God's church in the end time. I want you to know now is the time to stand upon our faith. Now is the time to claim every portion of our inheritance. Hallelujah, hallelujah. This altar is open. Let's come around this altar and worship God. If you feel like there's some things that haven't been haven't been working in your life or things that you want to see in your life, this altar is open for you to come. Claim every promise. Claim every promise that God has made to you. These are promises to each and every one of us within the kingdom of God. And these are promises to, right now specifically for you in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.